we are beginning to set up. Can people in chat hear me? Fantastic. Now we are doing the fun part where I try and make sure everything is up and running and uh, setting everything up. How are, how's the day going for folks? Fantastic. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm around. Hello. Hello. Um, Pablo. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Not a whole lot. Okay. Um, I think I have the event running. I am winging this so much. And uh, we're going to kind of maintain this tone, I hope. Um, to everybody in chat and everybody watching this recording, and I'm just double checking that the recording is in fact going. Welcome. Uh, we are doing a release stream to celebrate Python 3.13. Uh, this is a new version uh -huh. of Python with a few fun features in it. And today we kind of want to just talk about what's new in Python and kind of how do you poke the internals of Python and make something fun happen out of it and uh, kind of uh, talk about what goes into it. So Pablo and Vukash, would you two like to say hello? Hi there. I'm Mukash. I am in Poland right now, uh, which is a recent development. I spent uh, the last uh, three weeks in Canada and the US sprinting with this other guy on actually Python 3.14 mostly, but there was still some finishing touches on 3.13. Uh, yeah, I'm the developer in residence. Uh, this guy is not, uh, but formally maybe, informally, I don't know. He's kind of my boss, so uh, I'll let him introduce himself. All right. All right. I'm Paolo, who has... You are, you are cutting out, at, at least okay, on my end. Yeah, my end as well. One second. Uh, it... hmm. Better now? Yeah. Yes, mm. probably. Okay. Yeah. Keep talking. Awesome. Sure. Yeah, we... Uh... We may develop Python, but uh, we have uh, always problems with audio equipment. Um, but uh, <laughs> which is weird because, like, I'm the I, I'm the guy in Cordoba that has the weird voice controls, um, and I totally abuse them. Um, so yeah, I, I just returned from Python in Spain, so I'm extremely tired. Sorry if I'm a bit more weird than normal. Um, but yeah, I'm uh, I'm formally a Gukesh boss. Uh, that's that's what I was saying before. I prefer the formally the formally uh, part of that. Yeah. Um, awesome. Uh, you two also run a podcast together, uh, core.pod. Yeah, we do indeed. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Uh, normally we just fool around and talk about stuff that happened like, you know, well, theoretically in the past two weeks, but, uh, we, we haven't been super regular with releasing like over the past few months and, and specifically we chose like to have like a break over, over, uh, summer. Uh, but like this last episode that we just released was about the course print with people at the course print talking about what they liked uh, about, you know, working on Python and what they uh, worked on Python specifically during the course print week. Uh, it was just an idea, you know, because like theoretically less work for us, but it turned out to be more work editing later, uh, but also just sounds much more interesting because the people tell tell us like what they like in their own voice, so they're excited, and you know, and and it and it shows. Yeah, it was it was certainly not easy to edit. Probably I did zero of that because Google never allows me to edit anything <laughs> because he's a control freak. Um, I know how I to am. edit. I mean, I'm not too bad at it, but um, yeah, you you finish at five a.m. in the morning actually. Which yeah, is... something like that. 
but it, it, so 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 there was an issue that like was co caused by the small company that only has like one trillion dollars in valuation called Apple. We, we we are sharing our files between the two of us, um, like using iCloud Drive, and uh, one of the interviews that we made uh, at the sprint was a zero byte file in the end, and it showed like that Pablo edited it last, but like Pablo didn't even open those files. They were like just some internal files to Ableton Live. I'm not even sure like Pablo has Ableton Live like on this end. So it was just some some weird uh, like synchronization issue. And when I told Yuri, which I, it ironically was Yuri Solovanovs, uh, which is our close friend, uh, that yeah, like you're not gonna be in there. Like he was like, no, 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 no. Like we're gonna make another take right now. So he did like at like two a.m. for me when I was in New Brunswick over Starlink. Since I was in the middle of nowhere, uh, we, we did his interview again, uh, and it shows a little in the podcast that it sounds a little different from the the it others. A lot. I saw a lot. It's not a little. Like like literally, I have I, I was talking with people in Pagan Spain, and I, I was talking about the podcast, and they were like. What, what happened in that interview? Like, like who sounds really bad? Like, was he suddenly sick for just seven minutes? It's like, no, no, we, we no, recorded. It, it, it was, it was 2 a.m. and I was recording from my phone because I didn't have any equipment, any nice mic, anything. And I was over Starlink too. So, <laughs> you know, right. uh, a complication, a little complication. Now, that was a really packed week full of lots of stuff. What were some of the highlights for the two of you? I think for me, the, the, the highlight was like to meet everyone and be able to just brainstorm. Like it, it's, it's quite, like it's, it's difficult to explain, but like uh, the, the way normally things go is that you have a stupid idea and slowly you try to convince people and like you need to explain how it works. And so so when, when we kind of bootstrap new projects, like big ones that is not just a tiny feature or whatever, um, it takes a lot of time and like, you know, it's, it's difficult to communicate the excitement, but on the... On the spring, it was super great because, like, you can you know you can communicate like quite directly. And act actually, Nurse Snipe uh, Judy into doing this this asynchronous kind of thing, like just by being on the spring. And because like we are trapped together, basically, <laughs> he couldn't run away, uh, so he kept, he didn't have any excuse about like oh, you know I have my business that I need to run or whatever it is. So so um, it was it was perfect because uh, not only you could like you know meet everyone and have fun, but also like you can start working on these bigger projects together and. You know, that, that is the start of something that hopefully uh, will be in uh, 314. And probably many people have the same experience. Right. What about for you? What were some highlights? Uh, like, I always like to sort of plan what we're going to be doing next. But for me, really, there were um, a few open issues with the new interpreter. Haha, <laughs> spoiler alert, like about new features of Python 313. Um, and I was working with other people that knew best how to address them. So like very interestingly, like if you are in the room with somebody currently at Meta uh, who worked for Microsoft for 17 years and you tell them like that something really is impossible on Windows or it's hard to do on Windows, like they're just going to have to prove you wrong. So that was a productive time spent. And then um, there were other like kind of surprises about how terminal emulators actually work internally that we figured out. And I worked on a particular, uh, I don't know, regression, honestly, like with uh, Emily Morehouse, who not only made the fix, but also just said like, hey, your tests kind of suck because they are, you know, there's this blind spot here about the control characters. So we had to figure out like how to even test this. So now we have actually a, a, an a, a extremely like robust um, you know, test suite for the REPL, which, um, like we took the interpreter from PyPy and we're super grateful that we had this base to like, you know, hack on immediately. Uh, but like we added a ton of tests on, on that and Emily, um, contributed to that significantly. I worked with her. So like, you know, we, we can actually then just put her name in the code owners as well so that, uh, she's assigned to issues. Yeah, 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 and she cannot say no because she's not here on the stream. So, you know, like, it's, it's, it's the rules. Uh, with that, you talked about the new REPL and some of the tests for it. What is new in this REPL? And I think we'll start talking about the new features in Python 3.13. And uh, I think right. as we start so, talking like, about uh, 3.13... 
Oh, what? 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 Wow, that's also bring much a hat? bigger than my cup was, ever was. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Like okay. Yes, nice. over here. <laughs> cool. You know, uh, so the you know Pablo might tell you about like the less significant features, like you know, like rah, 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 like multi line editing, like rah, 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 like there's some uh, in pasting works and whatnot. Like who cares? Like I'm gonna tell you about the most important feature of the new inter interactive interpreter, when you type exit and press enter, it exits. Um, we were honestly, like we learned in the art of programming by Donald Knuth that this is physically impossible, that the complexity of such operation is just like beyond what can be put in, in the interpreter for Python. So we assumed that this was true for like decades in, in, um, in different versions of Python, but suddenly, you know, just Somebody we found this paper. Yes, you can challenge this. Last year. Like, like how to make interpreters exit is like really advanced. Yeah, so it's like, it's not even a solution. Exit. It was like a hack or something. Right. So yeah. So we are now on the bleeding edge of science here. Uh, actually, doing like research of our own, and now we can just type four letters and press enter, and the interpreter shuts down. It's it's, it's amazing. Right, right. Like once you try right. it, you can never go back. And the best thing is that we like when we implemented exit, we were drunk with power. We have so much power now in our hands. So we said like, now now we need more. So what, what other crazy things we can do? So we like we were at the um, not at the Python core developer sprint, but the C Python sprints that are like this thing when like we help contributors contribute to C Python at PyCon. And Bram Booker, which I can see here, he is here, so he can uh, hear me. Bram, I, I made a git before you, you did, and you cannot be here, so you cannot uh, counter my words. So that's true, or forever. <laughs> so Bram Booker told me like, hey, what about you implement clear? You know, like like when you control L in the terminal, and it clears the terminal, but instead of doing control L, you can type clear, and it clears. And I did, so so you type clear, it clears. It was it was harder than it was. Like we need, we we had to use more than this uh, nuclear power technology pa thing. Pablo, that, uh... Pablo, I have news. I have news for you. Do you see? Do you see who is typing right now? Oh like no! In the chat. Oh, uh, well, he he can communicate via text, but that's such an ancient <laughs> way of communicating. Like, uh, who, how how can I know that it's Bram Booker and not his dog or something? Like 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 you know, it's impossible for me to know. It's maybe an imposter. Like you, you, you cannot be here, Brand. If if it's you, just 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 join us in this in this stream. Like, oh, you can't. Oh, damn. Oh boy. Now I have hey. to figure out how to do that. No, 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 no. Oh, <laughs> he says he can't. Oh. Uh, okay. Now he, he'll awesome. be our Brand text. Uh, he's a real person. You know, text representation. Oh, okay. One sec. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. He, he's he's uh, doing something. No. Okay. Now I need to I need to uh, hide myself. I need to disguise my voice. <laughs> wow! Now, now, now there's been there's gonna be controversy. <laughs> Amazing. I'm an old boy. I'm a different person. Yes, you're, a... you're not. Yes, you're. Yeah, you're now big Pablo. I don't know how to say big Pablo. I know I, how I to can, say small Pablo. I can be a small Pablo. <laughs> ah, you're small Pablo. But I think the crisp uh, voice, like. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Like no, no suppression is oh. is suppressing kids. Man, this core is too smart for his own good. Like he's doing all this tech and whatever. And just 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 pass the audio, man. Like I have this like stupid. Oh no, it's Brian is doing it. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Hey, Brian. Hey, I, I don't know why you want me here, but I'm I'm happy to be here. Of course, That's of course. That's amazing. You have been summoned. We want you to publicly admit that that I did the JIT first. Oh yeah, there's there's uh, two JITs. You were actually the second JIT. C types has a JIT. What do you mean the second JIT? I mean the first. Literally, just no. like oh, last week, no. I had to be You were the second. Jordi I was the third. You were the second. Yeah, I was the third. Party. There, there's a JIT in C types far before either of us. Yes, yes, but but we did, we but we bring that as a we smuggled that one. Like nobody knew really that that was there. We never counted that. <laughs> So, the JIT that was a smuggle. Okay, so we're talking about the JIT, and I don't think we've introduced it. And I am someone who this is all very, very new to. What is the JIT, and why have three? Which one? Which one? Because it's different. <laughs> it's, Pablo's JIT is a lot more JIT useful JIT. right now, so he should talk about that one because he, well, he improved it. Well, mine, mine, your JIT. Uh, is zero percent faster, but my JIT actually is lower. 
Uh, it's just tiny, tiny slower, but like it's not the point. It's not the point. Uh, actually, I think it's easier if we start with Georgie because like mine is just a special case. It's just a it's just a, a bit of a, a a different thing. I think I think it's fair if we start with Georgie, the second. Jit. Cool. The third. Uh, the third. The third jit. Jit. You're the yeah, second. The, jit. the second. Yeah. The Jit. The, jit, the third. <laughs> Uh, I guess I'll start. Hi, everyone. I'm Brandt. I work at Microsoft on a team called the Faster CPython team, where we've been focusing on improving the performance of CPython for a couple releases. Um, basically, in 3.13, uh, it's not shipped in any of our normal releases, but if you feel so inclined, you can actually check out the main branch of CPython 3.13 uh, and basically configure it to be built with an optional experimental just-in-time compiler. Um, that will make some programs a little bit faster and won't affect most programs at all, just because uh, it's not quite ready for prime time yet, which is why we're not yet shipping it. I, I don't know how much of an introduction I'm supposed to give. I, I can get deep into compiler theory if we want. <laughs> we are winging it here. Um, I have a silly hat. <laughs> that's the theme we are going for. Uh, so the JIT itself is the just-in-time compiler, so as you're running your Python code, it sees that you've got a block, and it goes, I can make this faster if I just make some assumptions. And it swaps out your code with the code with an assumption, so that, like, a string is expected to be a string, you don't have to check to see if it's also an int sometimes, or a float. Is that generally correct? Yeah, it's a combination of a few different things. So we've had something similar to what you just described since 3.11. Um, we added a specializing adaptive interpreter, which basically sort of listens to your program as it runs and uh, replaces individual bytecode instructions that are being interpreted with kind of faster type specialized versions. It also caches stuff too. So if you're looking at the same method over and over and over again in a loop, um, for example, we'll cache that method lookup and it'll happen a lot faster. Um, and so we've had that for a while and that has all been turned on since it was first introduced. Uh, that was a source of many of the performance improvements in uh, 3.11. Um, what this does is it builds upon that where uh, once we've actually specialized the code like we do in 3.11, um, the specializing is worth doing on its own because it actually speeds up your program, but we can actually look at specialized bytecode and say, okay, what is this program actually doing? Like, since we've noticed that we're adding two strings together, well, we can actually do that a little more efficiently. Or since we're caching method lookups, um, this is all information that we you, you can use to optimize the program further. Uh, since Python doesn't have a whole ton of information to work with like before you actually start running your program. And so this is where just-in-time compilation comes in is basically we can take that information that we've learned about your program while it's been running uh, via specialization and actually um, kind of take the hottest parts of your program, so where your program is spending most of its time, optimize those more aggressively, spend a little more time and memory doing so, and actually compile that all the way down to machine code so your program is no longer being interpreted. Uh, those parts are actually compiled and run in a kind of native machine code. Um, so it's, it's basically taking all of the kind of dynamic stuff. Uh, like it, Python is incredibly dynamic, but most programs don't use the full extent of that dynamism uh, in uh, in like all of their all of the code that they're actually running. And so we can kind of exploit that and say, okay, well, these parts of the program are being run a lot and they're not fully dynamic. So we can actually compile those down much like you would a language like C. And then there is Python when everything is dynamic and the JIT is really confused. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, um, a, there's a lot of magic happening in PyTest, but I, I wouldn't necessarily call it uh, super dynamic when it's actually running the code. It's just like a bunch of pause generators if you kind of look at like PyTest while it's running stuff. And um, yeah. Now the so, REPL, on the other hand, that's, that's dark magic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so before we jump well, over to Well, it was also too. dark magic imported from the other interpreter that has a more powerful JIT than yours. Or yours. For now. Or, or mine. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get towards Pablo's uh, JIT, I do have a question. Where do people go to just kind of like start watching these Python enhance enhancements? Like watching? Define watching. Like, uh, I am not a core developer at all. 
I honestly, we are gonna to get to questions about like what are, what does core development, what does core team uh, mean and that sort of stuff later on. But like, if I just wanna sort of dip my toes and keep track of like, this is the direction language the language is going, this is where the faster C Python work is, this is where the changes in REPLs are improving and getting better. Where do I wanna start looking to just kind of begin to pay attention? Well, it depends on how much information can you digest uh, in in one day. If you want a big house and you want to literally like inspect every single diff, then subscribe to Python C Python and just die, just because it's just going to be like a stupid amount of commits and activity. Like by default, when you become a core dev, you get auto subscribe to that repo, and for a, for a while you're like, oh yeah, I will, I will keep my subscription, you know, like, I will be no. Like, no, everybody deactivated that. Like, I don't think there is anyone really subscribed to that. Maybe Lucas, because it's his job and whatnot. But like, you know. I am, but like, you have to start every single day by liberally unsubscribing from stuff you don't care about. Right, right. Okay. So, plus, like, it's like wake up to a hundred new notifications and just uns unsub unsubscribe to 80 of them. Yeah, but like, is, is that really being subscribed to it? It's like, I mean, if you ignore <laughs> half of them or even more, it's just, okay, okay. Uh, I, to, to some extent, I do the same, but the opposite. I just, I just start from nothing and then I subscribe to everything I like. But yes, sure. Anyway, if, if anyone wants to be like, you know, the big host, there you go. Like, just, just go to that. Um, then, um, if you want to just know the, the kind of like big changes to the language, you can do the same thing with the peps repo. So that's Python slash peps on GitHub. And um, those are like the, the, the PRs for like new peps that are proposed and, and the ones that are merged and whatnot. So you can like get the, the, those things. And if you want to participate in the discussions, uh, you can go to the discourse, not discord, uh, because like, you know, why, 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 why to choose like stupid names that are very close so to, so we have this discord, uh, server, sorry, discourse server. We also have a discord <laughs> server, but that's for, uh, Cordoba. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's Python dot, this, discuss.python.org. Uh, and then you can like check discussions between core devs and between community members, uh, but if you don't have time for that, because that is boring, right? You know, like you need to read all these messages and what's going on. You could listen to Cordo PY, a new established podcast when we discuss the, uh, I forgot about the introduction, the developments of CPython and our adventures to make the latest version of your favorite programming language. <laughs> Yes. Wow. That's, that's more or less what we say at the start of episode, uh, the, uh, like every episode. The first 10, we just said we are a new podcast. And now we say we are an established podcast. But now Pablo says we are a new established podcast. So, um, yeah, we're newly oh, we're established. Changing, changing. Just as a heads up, my computer yeah. has frozen, so I might disappear. Well, uh, since nobody's talking, uh, let me tell you about the real reason why we're here today, because you're, you're thinking Python 3.13, that's amazing. Let's talk about this. This is the new version, but actually, no, like this is, um, this is a support session for this uh, aging release manager who is saying bye to Python 3.8. So the same day where we're releasing Python 3.13 is the day of end of life in Python 3.8. We're not going to be talking about this today. I don't want to talk about it. I just want you to be here for me in this trying. Um, but I just want you to know that this is happening right now. And we can go back now to Python 3.13 and talk about the amazing features that 3.8 never had a chance to have, but it had a few of its own. Right. Well, uh, that, that's a bit onerous because I'm the next one in the line to lose like all my releases. I still release 3.10 for security releases and 3.11 back fix, but, but it's close yeah. to... It's close to uh, start dying. Wow, man. It's happening. Time passes very quickly. Oh, it does. <laughs> Bran, question. Like now, you need to answer. Like an answer faithfully. What is your favorite feature of Python 3.13 that is not your JIT? Absolutely the REPL. You hit it here. <laughs> and not just because we did it. Okay, so yeah, now we, you, we, we, <laughs> we are ready for the press. Microsoft employee says the REPL is the best feature of Python 3.13. You hear it here in uh, the Discord and the Discord server. It happened. <laughs> is the JIT... Okay, okay, be fair. Like, try to, try to actually answer faithfully. Do you prefer the JIT to the REPL? Like, 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 like you yourself? Not currently, because it doesn't make anything faster currently. But you could be proud enough. I, I, mean, I prefer the, the promise that you the JIT has to the promise that the REPL has. Okay. Ask okay. me again in a year. 
Okay. Oh, uh, 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 okay. But maybe you know what will happen. Then you 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 will jeep the rebel, and the rebel will be so fast that that you will say, "Wow, I love the rebel even more." And you will like it will increase super linearly, so you will never be able to love the jeep more. Like by by doing more jeep, you will love the rebel even more. What what about that? Maybe. Maybe we can even drop that I cash. I think my biggest qualm about the rebel is like its responsiveness. Yes, especially only when I face Frankenstein. Yeah. <laughs> So for everyone, well, this is where the jet is gonna help, right? Like when yeah, you so have a better jet. Cash. Yes, pasting Frankenstein is gonna be even faster. Yeah, so, so talk think, about Frankenstein people, now, Pablo. Yeah, let's talk about Frankenstein. So, so he, here, so, so this is what happened. So we did this rebel, right? Like not easy. We have to like bring this thing from Pi Pi, you know, like uh, and and change everything because like Pi Pi's rebel it was cool, but like it didn't support all the features that you you really want. Like for instance, if you use white characters like Chinese characters or Japanese characters, none of that. Like that was illegal, illegal, nothing. Uh, like you know, like uh, arrow keys behave a bit weird. So we we have to fix quite a lot of stuff. Like it was not just copy pasting code. Actually, it was like very much not that. Uh, Wukesh here like is a uh, typing uh, connoisseur. So he had a lot of illegal typing on the rebel because uh, you know we have this thing and we don't have typing, but now we have typing, so now all everything is typed. But then um, the bugs start to appear. Everybody was like trying it out, and then everybody's like, mm, "This doesn't work," and "This doesn't work," and we start to fix bugs. But then this one appeared, and someone says, "Hey, when I copy paste the entire text of Frankenstein, like by Mary Shelley, like the entire thing." And I paste it on the REPL because why not? Like, why, why would you, like, you know, what are you going to do with Frankenstein? Read it? That's for noobs. You paste it on the REPL. And then when you do that, it takes seven minutes. And that's unacceptable, you know, because like, I just want this pasted, right? Like, you know, like, how, how many Frankenstein do you do even, do you even Frankenstein, bro? So, like, uh, the problem is that it was saying in seven minutes because the, the algorithm to refresh the screen. There is there is such thing like I don't know if you know about it but like there is algorithms to refresh the screens it's like a thing, uh, it was it was quadratic like O N square no bueno, so 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 it, that, that was a disaster it was a PR disaster because like all the all the newsletters were saying like a stupid rebel cannot paste Frankenstein fast enough, uh, and then you paste it in the old rebel it was a stupidly fast because it was C and it was read line which is a it's a library where like people have thrown like enough uh, you know uh, interns and stuff that now it's like very fast. So, so we have to fix it. So, so we added this massive cache, like it's just enormous, and it just casts all the lines and the computations. Um, that's how you bring an O N square algorithm into linear. <laughs> and then now you can paste Frankenstein at almost the same speed as in the old REPL, but it's much faster than Pi 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 Pi's REPL because even if they JIT their own REPL and they have this crazy JIT with like amazing technology that like just uses these machine instructions, they cannot paste Frankenstein fast enough. Because our rebel, our rebel is better now. Well, I mean, no, they they copied over, so now they have the same rebel. So now, technically, they 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 probably paste it faster now. But like, you know, that's so, detail. So, so, this detail is actually interesting. So, what happened was this: when we were talking about actually having a, a rebel with multi-line editing, because that was the main feature that we we wanted, uh, we were looking at possible options. Where, where should we take it from? Because we're not going to be implementing it by ourselves from scratch like nobody will allow this because python is not a good place to sort of test new research that wasn't yet established right uh brand um so you know we, we just need to have use like established technology otherwise it should live on pypi and we look at like what, what things that were on pypi and a lot of them were very kind of awesome to use but had a, a lot of dependencies so like that would be un unfeasible for us to actually uh, grok and maintain looking forward, but the PyPy Pi REPL they, it looked good, so we were like, Yeah, let's let's take this. But it had a lot of things that we couldn't understand. So, as Pablo says, so I started just putting type annotations everywhere and making the type checker actually go through, like with everything. I had to do some refactors here and there to make the types like you know more obvious and so on and so on. But later, we started adding features like you know, like Frankenstein support and so on and so on. So at some point we diverged so far that the maintainers of PyPy said like, hey, we cannot possibly just, you know, port all your new features and fixes. There's no way we can keep up now. So what they actually did is they deleted their own REPL and just replaced it with our version. And now like 
they stole our stolen repo, and now that's that's how that's how it now goes. It's in, in the but 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 world. you know the, the plot twist. <laughs> they stole it first. So it turns out that the original Pi Rebel, which is Pi Pi's original Rebel, was in turn stolen, but st stolen like open source stolen. You know, like like not really stolen. So so it was it was made by um I forgot the name, but like but this guy was a C Python core dev. So like it was originally a guy who made like was a C Python core dev. And then like PyPI bring it, and then we copy it over, and then PyPI copy it over again. Like this is, this is the law, this is the dance of the rebel. Like now it's everywhere. Like it's in your kitchen now. I'm realizing I went about this whole JIT thing wrong because I should have done what you did and just been like, hey PyPI, can I use your JIT like you did with the rebel? That would have been so much <laughs> well, easier. Well, this is a bit more difficult than the rebel, you know? Like the <laughs> yeah, rebel because, because nice PyPy doesn't have a JIT. PyPy doesn't Pi, have a JIT. PyPy Pi Pi has a it, no, PyPy is a JIT generator. So like the, the entire reason why it like takes so long to build is like that it just automatically just finds ways in which like it should generate a JIT for the language that you're implementing. So like they have versions for Ruby and other programming languages like with that same JIT generator and they can uh, show like feasibly that, oh, okay, that also has a JIT now produced for this other language definition. So uh, you have to steal the JIT generator for C Python. Oh, that would be that would be interesting. I, I I know like very many core developers would be fascinated by like this 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 new way of developing uh, Python for now on. We we keep having these like generator things, right? Like we automatically generate the parser now. Like the uh, some part of the tokenizer, uh, like the the generated case dot h, which is part of the C val loop. Uh, like a bunch of things. Maybe we will be like in Python three eighteen. Like you just run like mm, like regen all, and there will be no code at, like at the beginning. And it will just generate the entire <laughs> thing. So like it, it just, just procedurally generates the interpreter. Yeah. yeah. No C so whatsoever. The, just... the JIT it itself just the is generated file. from a generated file. So like we generate first the generated cases for our tier two interpreter, and then we generate the JIT from those. So it's like a we already have like a second degree of code generation where we generate the generators from generated all code. the way down. So, yeah. so 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 this means that if you generate first the generated cases and then you evil evil brand like modifies that file secretly and then you compile that, then you can have like a like a, and and then you bootstrap the thing. Like you can have a JIT that has source in like like actual assembly in it that it was never part of the original source. Yes, in much like the same way, you could modify any file and then compile it, and it doesn't reflect the original. Ooh, dirty. Okay. okay, but we can, we so 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 <laughs> we need to measure now. Is 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 PyPy like now? Everybody try this. Like like not today because like you know you need to figure out how to do this. But like now we must know. Can you paste Frankenstein faster in PyPy? The latest version. You 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 cannot just install PyPy. You need to install the latest version that has our new PyRepo. So, so now we need to know if they are faster with the JIT or not, because we used to joke about this. We used to say like, you know, we can paste Frankenstein faster, like, and they are JITing and it's not enough. But now, now they are using the same code. So is the JIT really making past, like pasting faster or we just like reach peak computer science and it's um, impossible to improve even with like crazy JIT technology. Maybe that's the case. Okay. So at that point, I do want to uh, jump in and talk about you have lost me for a moment as my brain has gone foggy. Oh, that's right. Uh, so not just trying it, how do you try to compile from source for Python? Because some of these new features need to be compiled. They're not just default installed when you use Py E and V. So if you want to poke right. at some so of the stuff like the JIT, where do you go to see how to compile it and see how to build it? So the, the, the easiest way to compile Python like uh, on any platform is to use Linux. Um, this is true for <laughs> Windows as well and for Mac OS, like to some extent. Um, so on Windows, like you would want to use the Windows subsystem for Linux and just, you know, use the Ubuntu there because the Windows uh, instructions and so on are very specific to Windows. This is a development process that we have Windows experts that they definitely will know how to handle and so on, and we'll know how to help you and so on. I can talk about this. I'm running a Windows build, but like the computer right behind me is a Windows build, but that runs big memory tests for us. Um, however, it is just easier and there's more documentation and more people to help you if you're gonna just use Linux, which on Windows you can, there's a built-in Linux in your Windows now. 
So, so, so use this one. On macOS, more or less, you can do the same things, but there's always edge cases where like, you have to know that this is gonna work differently, this is not gonna work, and so on and so on. So the first thing that you're gonna do, assuming you're just doing this from, from Linux for now, like later on we can, if you really insist, we can t uh, cover Windows for a bit. Uh, so you, you, you would use Git to get some uh, clone of a Python repository. The reason you don't want to just use GitHub's like download a zip is because you will probably be interested in many versions. So it's gonna be easier for you to just browse many versions if you have an actual uh, like checkout of the repository versus just a zip file. So once you clone a Git repository, uh, you can fetch all the branches, you can look around which branches we have right now. Uh, so the branches are gonna be from Python 3.9 all the way to main. 3.13 is already a branch because that's already our released version of Python. It's uh, in bug fix mode. 3.14 is main, is what is happening now on the main branch. So when you're on main, you're building Python 3.14, a future version. And to build it, uh, you just do the very, I don't know, classic uh, commands to first configure and then make. So uh, and dot slash configure. By default, it's just going to run like a basic interpreter that should essentially be more or less like the production version, only without optimizations that take a long time to, uh, um, to um, I don't know, compute to actually go through. And then you say make, enter, and that's going to compile you a version that is still with the global interpreter lock and still with no JIT support. Um, yeah, and then there's different sort of options that you can give to configure to make different sort of variants of Python. Okay. Another option too, if you're using PyEnv on either Mac or um, Linux is I think you can pass configure args to that and it'll handle building it for you. So you just set like an environment variable with your configure args and it'll just make you a custom configured Python in your kind of PyEnv setup. No, that's cool. I didn't know you can customize PyEnv. Yeah, nice. yeah, that's how, yeah, that's how you sweet. get enable uh, LTO and optimizations and things like that. Okay. Nice. Just, I am configure right. something. Yeah, but it's in the docs. So, Wukash, at uh, EuroPython conference, you did a plane with the REPL, uh, which used the free threading version of this Python to do a bunch of sound generation. Right. Uh, say someone wants yes. to poke around and build something like that and play, what are the kinds of things that they should know in advance as like possible pitfalls? Oh, okay. That, 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 so that, that's a very broad topic. Like, first of all, like you need to know that like, uh, the, the free threaded version of Python in 3.13 is a sort of current state of our work in it. It is experimental and therefore disabled by default and not even available as like a, I don't know, like disabled toggle on the interpreter. It's an entire different interpreter because it will have a different, subtly, but like importantly, different C API such that C extensions that you're downloading from um, PyPI um, have to be either adapted or just, you know, claim that they work without a global interpreter lock. Uh, which is why currently I would advise for 3.13, for library authors, for framework uh, maintainers, like for, for those people to look at the free threaded version, because this is why we did this, why we actually released uh, an experimental sort of branch, I guess, of Python, um, so that the community can tell us, oh, this is interesting, this is actually help us scale, uh, or this is unusable, this is so crashing so hard or whatever. Like, you know, you wanna actually see the community use it because otherwise those are just theoretical questions. Like, is this gonna be stable enough? Is it gonna be fast enough? And so on and so on. But at the same time, the core team for Python 3.14 is working on still important improvements to uh, the free threaded version of Python. For example, now for correctness, uh, a lot of optimizations that the regular version of Python has are disabled. Um, Brandt mentioned the specializing interpreter, and that is entirely disabled if you're using the free threaded version of Python currently. So it would be amazing if we could, in a um, thread safe manner, actually have those uh, enabled as well. So this is happening for Python 3.14. So the one that you're going to be running now is going to be nominally slower on a single thread 
And that might be, you know, a kind of 30%, maybe 40%, depending on what you're doing. So you're going to notice like, okay, this is slower, but it's going to actually um, scale much better the more threads you add. But first you need to get it. So to get it, you're going to have to build it. And to build it, uh, you're going to have to pass configure options. So, um, you know, so that people can see as well and not just listen to us talk where or if if you just start saying slash slash dash dash, like it's sort of hard to uh, visualize all this. Like, can, can you maybe share the screen and show us like you know kind of where the actual um, build options of in Python documentation are? So I can I can send the the link in the in the chat once I have it right now, so we can talk oh. about those weird options that we have. Right? Yeah. So um, we can talk about those for a bit. Is there's many. Uh, and another thing I want to talk about here. is some of the team who works on these improvements over time. You've got the core team, but you also have people who do triage. You have people who yes. open up issues, uh, some issues of various quality, some issues of various perspectives. Um, and so uh, I should share my screen before I open that link. Um, we are about to go into uh a brave new world let's go ex exactly okay what are we in to change this tab so i know which one i'm about to share the best screens are the ones that aren't prepared to be shared uh, yeah and <laughs> we might be in them do it do it <laughs> uh ta -ta 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 -ta. we are going to make some choices okay Don't know why. Pablo, do you know any good jokes? Uh, only in Spanish. Mm. So tell one. Yeah. Oh, no, no, appropriate for for a public consultant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I am sharing, and I think I am sharing successfully. You are. I... Fantastic. I will not be able to see chat during this. Um but you are free to direct me as needed. All right, so um, I still see like just two two dots like kind of uh, moving around. I cannot actually see your screen, but what I can tell you, if you clicked on my link that I just showed you, this is actually a good starting page that tells you essentially what you need uh, to build Python on like different operating systems. So, you know, kind of on Linux and Mac OS is gonna be a CL11 compiler on Windows, like this is what you need, Visual Studio and so on and so on. And if you scroll down, you're gonna to get to configure options and there's a lot of them. And ironically, like they're sort of ordered in this weird way where probably the ones that are on the top are not actually that important. You're not gonna, you know, really kind of pull your hair whether you should disable IPv6 or not. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's very interesting things there where it's going to tell you that you can uh, enable or disable things. And uh, you have interesting stuff like enable PyStats, where you can actually gather internal Python performance statistics that like usually users of Python don't see. So you can uh, play with that and so on and so on. But the, the one that we actually want to talk about right now is dash dash disable dash gil. And that is actually build, that is going to build a Python version that does not have the global interpreter lock. Um, when you start su such a Python, it might still end up with the gil enabled. And this is because it loaded some C extensions that you had in your environment that didn't declare that they are safe to be running without the global interpreter lock. And therefore, uh, like Python to not crash will actually re-enable the global interpreter lock for you but you can actually just force it to be disabled, right? If you really want to try out like what's going to happen then and so on and so on. And there's mm -hmm. a helpful link there to three threaded C Python with a tutorial that talks all about like, you know, how to program for a three threaded Python, how it is subtly and not so subtly different. Um, and, you know, kind of it's, it's, it's going to cover a lot of details that maybe users are not so interested in as library and framework authors. But it also mm -hmm. covers some basics about how to like force Python to be uh, like to, to use or not use uh, the gil, which is either with the dash under uh, um, in uppercase X, 
there's a lot of options that we smuggle through dash uppercase X because you don't have to add a new command line option. You're just adding things to this magic option that has every option. So uh, dash uppercase X gil equals one means there's going to be a gil enabled even in that super uh, like experiment, experimental build. But you can say the opposite, which is dash uppercase X gil equals zero, in which case it's going to force the gil to be disabled. And then reading this tutorial, as you can maybe scroll through it, you're going to see that it is quite big. Like, you know, you can uh, figure out like, um, you know, I don't know how, how to use this kind of in a mm -hmm. toy application and maybe how to use it to something larger than, uh, than now. Like, for example, I was uh, sort of enamored by like a simple fact that if you already used async IO and you already had threaded uh, thread pool executors some somewhere, you don't actually have to change much code. Like you're already using what you have before, but now there's going to be more cases in which multiple threads actually run in parallel. Before you already had this a little bit because async IO is networked. And when we are waiting on a socket operation, we were already uh, kind of giving the global interval lock to somebody else. So you could already perceive some parallelism. It wasn't exactly like, you know, kind of true to its nature because there was always just one Python instruction being uh, executed. Uh, but, you know, like it's not going to be a super dramatic maybe difference, but you should be able to notice a difference. I know I did. Um, there's some benchmarks that use async IO that are already faster in uh, the free threaded version, even though uh, we didn't really optimize for that yet. Okay, interesting. Um, I'm apparently being told that it did not stream to anyone, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I uh, saw the little loading thingy the entire time, and I still see it now. Just quickly popping in. So, okay, so Keith, bottom left hand corner, mm -hmm. uh, where it says uh, screen. Right. Uh, share your screen, click it. Uh, yeah. uh, change windows. Roger. And then select the one that you want, click next, and then there will be an option for better text readability. And sometimes changing the quality can make that huge difference because currently you're streaming at 30 frames. And this will reduce it to either 5 or 15. Uh, yeah, it uh, is just not... Stop streaming and start it again. Do, and then, do. so, when after you select the window, hit next. Apologies, everyone. This is uh, the fun of voice and Discord. Okay, so I've got allow, and then it just goes straight into it. It does not allow a next. We might just pass this point for now. Yes. Well, the recording has me mousing over things accurately. I apologize for the audience. Uh, you know, this is right. Discord. So, so let, let me just, yeah, that, that is fine. Let me just uh, paste the thing that I want to talk about, which is, well, I already did, but it passed our screen. So maybe I'll just re reference this thing like a passive aggressive person per my last email uh i can just say look at this thing i clicked something i didn't see maybe i liked my own post that's terrible no never do that uh okay so look here there is uh, how to configure python and you're all gonna find dash dash disable dash gil that t t tells you about how you can uh, build a python without a global interval lock and there's a free threaded cpython link there that takes you to the what's new, that has a nice sort of summary of what you can do if you don't have the gill. Uh, but then there's an even better tutorial about porting extension modules that you can click on and see like, you know, kind of uh, how, to, how to write uh, kind of extension modules with Python. And there's also a, an even like a, I don't know, like a list already community maintained of who already supports free threading. And uh, this is in this, uh, okay, there's a, the, you're going to see like a yellow box there. And if you click on porting extension modules to support free threading, this is like on the transition from Python 2 to Python 3, you could see who already supports Python 3. This is sort of similar where it tells you exactly about how to do those things. And somewhere there, there should be a list of, uh, of who already does this. 
Now I'm actually clicking through this. That might be actually a different uh, website, so I'm entirely lying to you. Because I, I remember... Oh, okay. No, this is the same thing. Only this already links to a sub-page, which is porting. But if you click on the hamburger on the pi-free threading github.io thing, which I can maybe just link to, because you also don't see my screen, which is amazing. We're, like, we're, we're good at technology here. Uh, look, so this is a third-party maintain, but it has like a lot of fun things in it. Um, and one of those things is uh, compatibility status tracking. So you can already see like, you know, who already claims support for free threading and who already tests this in CI and so on and so on. So some of the kind of heavy hitters like NumPy, they had wheels for support for a free threaded Python before 3.13.0 was released, right? So they were ready like from day one, which is amazing to see. Um, and you can see that already like pill pillow is, right? Yeah, so obviously, like, are they all bug-free for 3.13? Well, probably not. Like, is the free-threaded 3.13 currently bug-free? Probably not, but this is how we get there, right? Like, mm -hmm. with actual kind of community support with, you know, like, uh, strength behind it, with people interested in it, and so on and so on. Um, so, yeah, I'm pretty positive about this, but you will have to actually build your own Python to, uh, to test it out so far. But you shouldn't expect miracles just yet. Uh, this is mostly for library and framework maintainers, which as you can see, uh, a lot of the most popular ones are already uh, invested in this. So with that adoption, I believe Shantnu had pointed out that it seems like people are adopting the newer version of Python faster than they had been in the past. Um, I believe, oh, this is what happens when you are in too many threads for too often and you forget about stuff. But I believe there was a plot that was demonstrating uh, adoption of the newer version of Python and showing that over time more libraries had been adopting the latest version of Python faster than they had been in the past. And I was curious, what do you uh, think yeah, like is the, the reason why people I, are I think able to? One of the reasons is because we have been a bit annoying with this, but like I think the 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 thing that makes quite a big difference is the um, CI will will project uh, because like basically here is, is is a bit of a chain. Um, like people need to start testing their libraries before in the um, release process, like with the alphas and betas. Uh, but there is also like this tension because um, if if you build like a version of your library. Uh, for the alphas, then every alpha can invalidate that wheel. So, so that package, which means that you need to publish one version every every alpha. So everybody waits basically for at least uh, the first betas. But like even in the betas, like different betas can still change the 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 wheels and and wheels like basically prepare for beta one may crash in beta two. So actually, everybody normally really starts only publishing the early adopters really start to publish in unreleased candidates because that's when when everything is frozen. The problem is that if you have an application and you want to test for Python 3.13, um, you want your dependencies to also be in Python 3.13, and your dependencies need their dependencies, and their dependencies need their dependencies. And at the end of the day, like it's very, very hard for, for an end user that uses PyTorch to actually have the whole thing on 3.13. Um, so that that is one thing that really didn't went away in the sense that people are still kind of like uh, they have this problem when testing too early because we we keep changing things so the fact that it works on a version doesn't mean that it's going to work on the next uh, beta for instance but on the other hand people have been uh, using like projects like CI will will and other uh, like projects like, like this to start more easily publishing uh, those wheels before and in turn the dependencies of CI will will like for instance having 313 beta something available on github actions earlier uh, which I think in turn it depends on the snakes so I've only basically been uh, on the day of the release and things like that uh, or PyM, I don't know where they're getting it from. But uh, basically, the, the, it requires that everybody really moves really fast. And after, I think, 3.11, things started to peak quite a lot. I remember when I released 3.10, um, I think it was at the time 3.10, it took NumPy like two or three months to support 3.10 at the time. Uh, 3.11 was almost on the release, and uh, for sure 3.12 was like literally on the release. They were already NumPy wheels and Pandas wheels and SciPy wheels, so, so quite fast. And I think it's just because, like, you know, these these little improvements have become more possible, but also because I think, um, uh, like, 
people uh, have been like trying to push a bit harder for like the new versions. I mean, it depends on, on the environment and whatnot. But um, but yeah, that that's one thing. There are still challenges though. Like we we keep breaking basically things that have like weird arrangements uh, between versions. So for instance, the optimizations that we're doing some of the times break Cython because Cython likes to poke at the internals. And that's not really supported, but you know, like it's still annoying. So there is a lot of breakage along the way, which makes it makes us our life also harder. Because, for instance, in the speed.python.org server, where we test if uh, new versions of Python are faster or not, um, there there is some of those tests that need libraries like uh, Django, right? For instance, or like um, Jvent. I think is the worst one <laughs> that we break all the time. Uh, so so those, we we need those libraries to test how if Python is faster using those libraries, for instance. But most of the time, because of changes we do, those libraries break. So we cannot test Python in those libraries because those libraries are not compatible with the new Python. So so there is this kind of dependency problem still, and that's what makes, uh, you know, most of these libraries not trivial to just support new versions, unfortunately. Um, but uh, the, the reason people are picking them up is because, like, now, you know, maintainers are taking this thing a bit more seriously. And I think, or I, I would like to think that this is the... Um, you know, partially at least is motivated by us being very annoying, <laughs> like please test our versions and whatnot. Well, and you mentioned the kind of benchmarks. Those, it's kind of nice because those serve as like canaries for like how much stuff are we going to break with a given change or in a given alpha or whatever. Like we don't really have like some big collection of projects that we try to build with every new Python release. I know Red Hat does uh, some of that and they're good about spotting early regressions, but like I know for me personally, there have been times when I've been about to make a change and when I go to run benchmarks on it, I see, oh, for whatever reason, this broke Cython or G event or whatever. Um, and so that definitely makes me like put the change in context, like, okay, well, is it really worth you know, uh, making this change and then having to, you know, uh, also update whatever project or wait for them to update or or whatever. So speaking of regressions, in the release candidate two, I think it was two, uh, there was a regression that was discovered through PyTest uh, where it had slowed down because of the incremental garbage collector, uh, which was a change to make garbage collector collection less uh, burst or boom and bust cycles and much more continuous. I'm curious, uh, because Python has recently gone to a yearly release schedule, do you feel like the ability to make the change to just roll back the inc incremental garbage collection was easier to do because you know you'll have another release in a year, so it's not going to have to sit on the shelf for very long? Uh, do you think that the way you're doing releases makes it a lot easier to handle those unforeseen regressions? And then uh, talking to the Python speed tests and the other sort of benchmarks, what are benchmarks that have been seen recently that you're like, oh, I've never have thought of that before? A bunch of questions here. I mean, certainly the 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 last time it passes since we detect a regression the easier it is to uh to fix like one of the things i'm actually working on right now is to detect regressions uh like or, or sorry like things that break the build bots on the same day so we can revert them much quicker because otherwise like all our comments pile up on top of those and like for instance when when um thomas Walters reverted the uh garbage collector uh change it was not a single commit. He needed to revert, like, I think, like six commits uh, that were like in the middle, so not not contiguous. So it was it was harder. You can imagine the effect of having to do that with another year of like stuff in the middle, right? Like, I mean, we probably will have detected that earlier. Who knows? But like, you know, we will see. By the way, I mean, this is still very much being discussed. Is is it looks like we want to still like fix whatever is going on and have it this like uh, incremental collector for 314 right now we are discussing it even more so it's, it's, it's still unclear if we will have a incremental collector in 314 i mean probably we will but like it's still like for instance one of the reasons is that i mean it's, a, it's an advantage because like there is applications that do care about the throughput so like if you, if you pause like you know your entire program like, so your web server is not doing any requests or whatever or your pi game is just frozen no frames uh, just because he has to do like an entire GC stop, uh, that's bad. So so probably you want to do these smaller ones so you don't have this like mega pause in the middle. Some other programs don't care, but like some do. So so it's, it's, it's good. 
the problem is that <laughs> there is no benchmark that got better because like we don't have a benchmark that says what is the throughput of this like with the, the the benchmark that we have in the speed.python log server for instance are things like how much does it take to collect all these objects well it takes even more because like now you do this yes. in many many bosses uh, which means that you need to run even more times um just just a bit no no a lot right so so we didn't we didn't um actually experience any immediate measurable thing and it turns out that there is some discussion around that uh, i mean on, on the light of the fact that we have to revert it we didn't knew enough about like the facts of this um the benchmarks are really specific the one that we know that indeed th this application will get better but clearly we lack exposure to like a lot of different applications and modes um in particular the reason like the the, the way we experienced the problem was that the doc test uh, test in CPython, which is, is these tests that, that basically run the, the doc strings and whatnot, they, they went from six minutes to 16 minutes or something like that. Um, so, so quite bad. But if you actually measure like individual things uh, and like how, how much it takes to run like a Sphinx or like a specific things, it's like 15% slower or something like that. So it was not dramatic. It's just that now you get like this composable effect or like something is going on. Like it's, it's just unclear and you cannot just measure it to one it slice. And as a person who actually maintains the garbage collector and, and made improvements in the past, like, like um, you know, fixing resurrections and things like that, this is a very challenging thing because like these effects are really in the fire. Like you, you, it's not the kind of when you have a bug or something, it's not something that you will see immediately. Like boom, it crashes. No, it's normally the bug happens at time zero and six million years after that, you will experience the actual problem. So, so tracing it back is just bananas. So, so the, the the reason we didn't experience this before is well because you know it's it's, it's very challenging to to uh, and you need to test like many different applications will behave differently. Like if you create a lot of cycles, then you will suffer it more than if you don't. It turns out that apparently Sphinx is a cycle factory. So, so that's that's probably like uh, I mean we, we maybe we'll have detected this if we look at the times a bit more, um, but um, but that that makes it a bit more challenging. Um, so yeah, that that regarding the GC. Um, I'm still curious about, uh, whether or not you've seen, whether or not new benchmarks have really surprised you, but I'm also curious about, uh, you had talked about how Tom, Tomas had to work back through like six commits, uh, that were already stacked beneath a bunch of other commits in order to pull back that change. How is that similar or different to your role as a release manager for versions of Python that are further back in the past, uh, and maintaining those and doing bug fixes and what does it look like to maintain a version of python a few years down the line past the release well probably cookies do you want to take that one yeah so when you when you uh shut down one of your branches you feel like you know like a death in the family it's terrible it's terrible let's just like a minute of no 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 I'm, I'm kidding like so okay let's start from the beginning at first like you you're getting chosen by some unknown body no now it's the steering council before the steering council it was really unclear like you know how uh, release managers are chosen now it's uh the steering council and like you get chosen to be the release manager and what do you do then well, nothing for quite a while because uh you only start releasing alpha versions after the previous a uh, final release happens. So now Hugo van Kemenada, who's going to be the release manager of Python 3.14 and up, uh, without specifying any future versions because we don't know what they are going to be. Um, so he is going to release his first alpha version in a week. But so far, like he has already done some preparatory work, like seen how this is working, you know, in theory. But the first actual movements are going to be in a week, and then we have seven alphas where. Uh, they're very quick to build. You're not caring about any installers, about any documentation, specifically not the documentation that ends up being PDFs that builds forever. It's it's pretty quick, so you do a bunch of those things, and then it's time for beta. In our release process, uh, the beta is when you freeze features. You no longer add features. So, and you do this for your first release. This is a big deal because now your main branch starts being called your version number. You're actually moving to a new branch. So now. The new one is going to be 314, but that's going to be in May. Now it's main, right? Like it's just free for all. You can add any feature you want. Well, probably not. Just actually try to get consensus, right? It's like smaller features are discussed in issues. Larger require peps, right? Um, but you know, like, so 
in, in the betas, we have four of those. You just try to actually kind of gather everybody to uh, fix their problems. And suddenly we have RC1, RC2, and the final release. So what happens after the final release? You release bug fix releases every two months. And those uh, for the first few releases are really, really kind of packed with new fixes. And those aren't fixes that are like most of the time are uh, actually deal breaking, but they are indeed bugs that are getting fixed. There's a lot of kind of activity for the first few bug fix releases. And then it sort of calms down um, until you reach a point uh, in my time, I was a year and a half later. And these days it's two years after the release of final where you're like, okay, enough with the bug fixes, because at that point you already have two newer versions of Python. Uh, and you're saying, we're only going to be releasing security fixes for this. And so far, this is maybe going to change now. So far, it's been like, if we are releasing only security fixes, we're not going to be building installers for Windows and installers for the Mac for this. There's only going to be source, and you have to build it yourself if you want to, or rely on your, I don't know, Linux distribution or another provider to build the security uh, builds for you. And then three years later, you just say, okay, like this uh, particular version of Python reached end of life. We're moving on uh, to the next uh, version. So, you know, um, there's less and less change overall, right? When you have a bug fix release, what that uh, actually means for us is still somebody, when they find a bug, they want to fix it in main. So even if I had like Python, uh, well, 3.11, right? Which still gets like, bug fixes, right? Like what you, what's going to happen is we still fix it in 3.14, so in main, and then we backport it to 3.13, 3.12, and only then to 3.11, because we want it to, 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 we want it to be fixed everywhere. And those backports sometimes are very trivial because the code didn't change that much. But increasingly, the code did change, more or less, so you have to uh, help those backports a little, or sometimes a lot, to actually not conflict and to apply. So the release manager would often like help with that, you know, because it just they, they know the release. They know like, oh, this this particular version doesn't have the support and tests for this particular thing, so I need to do it manually or so or something or something. And finally, when the bug fixes are done and you only accept security uh, fixes, you just close the branch. You say nobody can actually, uh, you know, actually merge any pull requests to this branch. People can still open pull requests because they want something to be fixed. But that physically, the green button is only available to the release manager. So is it more work? No, because there's way fewer changes when it's only security only. Uh, and uh, every now and again, somebody would really push for some documentation change or some updated test because some build, build bots are failing otherwise because operating systems actually upgraded and, and behave differently. But usually we would only accept security fixes for the last three years of the release. And yeah, did I answer everything? Because I was talking for quite a while now. That does cover a lot of it. And I think it kind of leads into one of my next questions is what does the core team do now that a release has just happened? You had your sprint a couple of weeks ago, uh, did the release candidate last week and have the new release now. And then do you like hibernate for a month? Do you just go back into more work? You said that you are still like, 314 is the new hotness, but what do you do now that you have hit a release, you've finished one of the uh, older ones that you are a release manager for, what happens now? Well, well we pick up a million of pineapple yeah. bugs. That's yeah. the way we do. And, that's it. and Brown goes back to legit. Yeah, you hit the ground running. We've only got till May to actually get our new features in. So, you know, clock exactly. ticking, right? Mm -hmm. Like we've spent the last couple of months like fixing stuff and now it's like, okay, that's in a good state. So uh, all the new stuff has to get in soon. Yeah, I mean, if you zoom a lot in the activity, like normally we start like also thinking the, like preparing peps for new features for 314. Like for instance, I have 304 like in the queue. Um, we still have to finish the rebel pack that people wanted, so that's this commission. Um, uh, but then, like, there is new ones. Like, for instance, I uh, opened like literally last week uh, one pack that we prepared with uh, Brett Cannon, 
um, that I prepared with Brecan about like uh, allowing, it's a small thing, it's just allowing parentheses, no, allowing to draw parentheses and accept uh, handlers. So you don't need to do like with parentheses, uh -huh. you know, accept parentheses, blah, 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 blah. Uh, because those parentheses are really not needed. Uh, there is some discussion around if you really need them, if you put as, because like that reads weirdly. Um, but now it's being discussed on discuss <laughs> on the Python the dark. Um, so yeah. go there. There is a poll. You can vote uh, so your voice can be heard and whatnot. Um, it's a non-binding poll, so I may just ignore everything. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but, um, but, you know. There is only two options, so I need to ignore at least one of them. Um but yeah, uh, and I, and we have another big, uh, big one coming uh, for improving assets and whatnot. But yeah, that's that's probably like at least how I do things. Okay. Um, you talked about engaging on discuss.python.org and that sort of stuff. Uh, what does engaging with the core of C Python mean? I know we have one of the triage uh, individuals in our chat, uh, Coffee, um, or at least he's been here. I'm hoping he's still here. Hi, Coffee, how are you doing? Uh, what is like, there's the core developers who are a part of the overall core team, and then there's triage people. What is the family of C Python like? What is that structure? So from my perspective, it's never been actually easier to contribute to Python uh, because GitHub makes it like very feasible for people to contribute without having any special roles. So um, in the olden days of Mercurial, like you couldn't, there, there were no pull requests. You, you had to uh, be a core developer to actually make anything moving. You could, as an external contributor, use the Unixy patch tools to just, uh, you know, just attach a patch file to an issue and just count on somebody to be able to also reproduce this patch, you know, to apply it to their uh, checkout in the current version and, you know, actually run something with it. But in the end, they were actually doing the entire commit with the message and everything else. Like you had very little control. Now with GitHub, pull requests are relatively easy to do. I'm not, I'm not talking about the technical difficulty of contributing to Python, I'm just talking about the actual technology. Like GitHub is so popular that, you know, if you are into development, you're gonna know how to make a pull request, right? At some point it's, it's gonna be obvious what the motions are. So you can now like see what, what the uh, kind of expectations for uh, issue when you're opening it uh, are, or what should actually be in a pull request or not. And if not, a bot, and the statuses that you're gonna see like green or red are gonna tell you what's missing. So it's very easy. And because of this, we sort of expect this to be the uh, kind of entry point to contribution. Uh, we wanna see somebody already doing the work because it's like, we don't want to people to do work for free for us, but like, if you wanna contribute, you can do it. Like you can start today, right? And when uh, people do this for a while, and we see that they're productive, we will, uh, you know, tell them, hey, like you can actually have a little more power here in which it means like you can actually assign uh, issues to people, you can put labels on there, uh, you can close issues if you think that they're not worth doing or they were actually completed and so on and so on. Uh, so you become a treasure. Um, and that treasure actually has right access to a bunch of repos, not CPython itself, but like a, a bunch of supporting repos in our organization are just uh, writable to them and so on and so on. So um, you already start now being a more active member of the team, right? It's not just as I l recently learned like about just the technical contribution, but also just about being around and being, you know, kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, a buddy helping others like make their uh, kind of changes that they want to actually get through, help them make it happen. Like, you know, put reviews in, um, fix backports so they don't conflict and they're not read and so on and so on. And after a while, when you have enough of that collaboration and enough pull requests of your own, uh, we can nominate you for core development, which in fact just uh, happened last week for one person. 
And currently, we're just awaiting for the uh, steering council to say if they're okay with it, because the vote is already over on uh, this course. And we might actually be looking at another core developer. So this process is active. It happens all the time. Uh, and it starts with a person coming on GitHub and just contributing something. So the best way to contribute is to find a problem uh, in a part of Python that you're already a user of. That's how, you know, you don't have to look for easy issues. You don't have to kind of find work for yourself. You already know like what you, uh, what, what you want to do, what, what the problem is and so on. So what were your three introductions to CPython? Uh, where did you enter in? What were kind of the issues? And then what are the parts of CPython that make you excited to poke at and to play with? Uh, as far as I can remember, the the way I got started with CPython was kind of the way anyone gets started in open source, is you find a bug and then you uh, go about fixing it. And uh, thankfully, I, I found a bug that was pretty simple. I think the fix was like three lines or something like that. Um, but uh, I really, really liked that experience. It was fun to contribute to something like CPython. And I thought, oh, I could do more of this. And so I started just kind of uh, lurking on the issue tracker and you know, doing all the triage things, so reviewing PRs, responding to new issues, um, seeing if I could reproduce issues and stuff. And as you do more and more of that with time, like as you're reviewing PRs and responding to issues and all of that, like you start to kind of develop your knowledge about the code base and then you start kind of stepping outside of your comfort zone. And when you see an issue that you feel like you might be able to fix, then you, uh, you know, start actually uh, trying to take on more work and learn new things and all of that. Um, uh, over time, I started uh, implementing new features and wrote a couple of peps uh, just for little syntax changes or, or things here and there. Um, and then I got involved in the performance work a couple of years ago, and that's what really interests me now. Um, just because I think it's such an interesting problem, like uh, making everyone's code faster, but without breaking it, right? Like that's that's a really, I mean, the, in theory, the design space is huge, but you have all these really interesting constraints that, um, I don't know, it's like, it, it's right at that kind of, tipping point of like research and engineering that, that that really just speaks to me and that I really enjoy. Did you say small syntax changes, but you participate in Python? Tiny, much tiny like, little, little syntax tiny, changes. Tiny, tiny syntax no. changes. Nope. How many new keywords have I added? Well, keywords zero. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Pattern matching, you know, pattern matching has a little more five. surface area than anything I'd done prior to that. Yeah. <laughs> That was a lot of fun too. Yeah. Pablo, what about you? Yeah, I think. Yeah, in my case, I think uh, like I, I I I always say like the first PR I had, I think it was the documentation. Like some 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 example didn't have an import and it just started there. Um, but I very quickly I like, started to contribute to like the C parts of of C Python. Um, like got better with time. At the beginning, it was a bit disastrous, but uh. Like uh, I I enjoyed it very quickly and I knew for, like immediately that, that was the the part that I enjoyed the most, um, and uh, you know like the same very very, very similar story as everyone here like I started to to try our things and like like uh, try to fix small bugs here and there like one of the things I focused quite a lot was trying to um, in this like running C code and things like that but like trying to get get exposure to many different things to, so I contribute to like almost everything like the multiprocessing, sub process, uh zip stuff, uh the parser, tokenizer, like GC, VM. So one of the things that that you know that that helped me a lot is is to just understand a lot of C Python just by doing. Uh, so I didn't sit down and like just read the code. I, I always were reading files with a purpose. Like okay, I need to find out how the parser, so how the compiler does this thing because there is a bug I'm fixing. So I need to like understand well what's going on, and that also forces you to understand. Like it's not you, you cannot just have a sense of, oh yeah, I understand what's going on because like otherwise you're not going to fix the bug. Uh, so that, that's great. Um, but yeah, these days I mostly work on on parser stuff and uh, like uh, the GC stuff, and uh, but but I'm starting to just go again to poke on more different like things and adventures like for instance this parable thing is, is obviously totally different 
Um, and I started to work a lot on, uh, like, uh, uh, with the work I started with uh, better error messages in Python 3.11 and 3.10. Um, at the beginning, those were partial, those were partial improvements, but uh, very quickly they become, like, everything improvements because, like, the, you know, we, we changed the, the entire VM to, you know, record the positions that then brand using his specializer, uh, like, like, package. And um, now we, we are changing like error messages everywhere. Now we are adding color, which is also in like tracebacks and we have to change a lot of the traceback machinery. Um, and the latest thing that I was working on in the spring uh, if you, uh, was uh, with Yuri Selivanov on uh, Async IO monitoring, which is an area I'm also very active uh, outside CPython, uh, profiling on debuggers. So that's, that's the other thing. I'm probably like one of the contributors that, the contributions that I'm very excited about uh, in the future. Um, and I'm just prototyping right now is in PDB. So, you know, a bit all over the place. Uh, but my heart, like what brings me joy is probably parser stuff because that's what I really like to do. The Dragon Book. Yeah, I have I have several. I have the first edition here. <laughs> and okay, you, your turn. Well, in 2010, early on, uh, I got a job that was supposed to be Java, but then it wasn't. Uh, and... And they told me, you know what? You put on your CV that you like Python. So how about you go and write Perl for us? Because it's the same thing. Uh, so I got tricked into working on Perl and I hated it. Uh, so I figured out at some point that like, if you use uh, like a special multi-line string syntax in Perl, like they're called here docs, you can just pipe in your program to something else. So I started writing Python in this Perl because I noticed that there's some ancient versions on Python 2.3 on the same server that compiles everything. So I started doing that and I was productive for quite a while. Um, and a lot of this required me to parse any files that were produced by this Perl thing. And I couldn't because the built-in library for this config parser had some limitations that made it like not work with those files. And it didn't seem like the any files were the fault here. Like, honestly, you should be able to like parse those files in those particular cases. So I started reporting this and, you know, it turned out that there's nobody to fix those problems because I have them on Windows uh, with Python 2.3. So I started putting fixes in there, uh, suggested fixes. And after, um, I don't know, like, 30 of them or something, and the maintainer of config parser at the time and the author of it just said like, hey, how about actually we give the uh, newcomer the commit bit so he can just fix the problems that he encounters. And then I continued seeing the problems because I was running Python 2.3 on the server that I could use, but the version of Python I was working on in, in late 2010 was Python 3.2. We were already not working on Python 2 at that point. So it took me years and years to actually see what my, my changes did to config parser. And by the time people started using those changes, it turned out like, hey, you have made a, a series of terrible mistakes. And most of them are now like fixed and it's all good. But like some of my early contributions, let's just say they were not exactly perfect. Um, but yeah, like it, it was essentially just scratching my own itch and in the meantime, like I started being more interested in like, you know, uh, typing things, but before typing, it was already like, you know, classifying function sort of execution, uh, by type of the argument and so on. So like the sort of first pep that I, that I wrote was just adding a single function to func tools. And it was a big deal to me at the time because it was, uh, essentially re-implementing the algorithm that Python is using uh, to figure out what method to call next. And it can be quite tricky uh, because you have multiple inheritance. And this is also made more tricky if you have abstract base classes. And because of this, like there's the single dispatch that we're talking about right now, like has a custom uh, implementation of this so that it uh, you kind of, it can uh, compute distance between two versions uh, of a function and choose the one that fits better. So, you know, kind of that was, that was the introduction back then. Um, I was fired from that job because they were like, you shouldn't be using Python. It's not a, uh, I don't know, like it's not a programming language that is allowed for this job. So I went somewhere else, which was great. Uh, that was the only job I was ever fired from. Uh, and after a year in that new job, I got a call 
from my previous boss, like asking me some Python questions. And I'm like, hey, didn't you fire me because I was using Python? And they're like, ah, forget about it. And now there's an entire team of people using it because it's so much better. So yeah. That's quite a uh, exit and return to, I think I was right. <laughs> Yeah, so, I was I was quite satisfied with both the outcome of the job and because the of the Python adoption. So, all good. So you had talked about your original commits weren't perfect, and to anyone who's interested in just kind of like poking at core of Python and learning and hopefully moving towards that, uh, beginning to make issues that are coherent and beginning to make pull requests, what are some of the sort of mental barriers that they shouldn't let themselves stop because of. Like, I'm someone who definitely uh, doesn't do things occasionally because I can't do them perfectly. I imagine that's a similar roadblock that I shouldn't uh, let stop me. What are some other things? Mm, I think in CPython in particular, I mean, the, the, there are the things that apply to every open source project, which I think is less interesting to discuss here. But like the, in CPython in particular, there is this very specific problem that a lot of people find and, and it's kind of a blocker, which is that um, is, is, is very little amount of low hanging fruit. Like it's not like uh, other projects when there's like a lot of easy issues and, you know, hack, like, uh, you know, sprints are very easy because you just handle them uh, these issues. Here, what happens is that even if like either the issues are really complicated and it's just a matter of like choosing from the meh solution to the meh solution, uh, but also there is the the fact that like even if if the actual change that the, the some issue is asking for is very easy, then there is a discussion that has been there for two years. So the first thing that I will have to advise is that um you, like try to focus on things that you really care because like otherwise if you, if you just like yep. try to pick up like something after you're going to get burned by this and it's not going to be fulfilling like because you need to. You, you, like your PR is not like just bookers that have to wait like three or four years. Right now with the yearly cadence, it becomes a bit easier to see your contributions out, but but it will take a lot. Like uh, I remind, uh, I remember that um, I think we mentioned this on some Cordo PY episode. We merged one of these PRs on the, I don't remember what it was, but like one of the PRs that we merged this year was sitting there for three years. So, so I mean, it's not the case that like the average, I think is much lower than that, but like your PR will be sitting down for a long time. Uh, contribution is going to be slow, and and I don't say this into the third people, but like the key, like the key here is that try to find something that really, really drives you. Like it needs to be like like Brand was mentioning before. Maybe you have some bag that you really care, and like you just, just you just hate it. Or like for instance, now in PyRepl, PyRepl, very important. Uh, you will find a lot of weird shit, uh, and some of those weird shit like is things that you really don't like. Like like man, I cannot use this thing because it's, it makes me crazy. You know, maybe you're on Windows. Uh, and, um, and meanwhile, you move to a superior operative system or something like then you, you said there's something that doesn't work uh, and then you want to fix it because like it, it makes you really, 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 really sad. And it's the last thing that, you know, is there before you use it. So maybe you can fix that one and fixing that one will, will drive you through the whole discussion. Um, and that like is something that is a bit more common on, on CPython. So it's always good to have it. And also the fact that people push you, push back on your suggestions or your ideas doesn't mean that, you know, you're stupid or, or, or you're not enough or something like that. You know, people push uh, to all ideas and it's just not because they don't like you or they don't like like what you're doing. It's just because like everybody wants the best for the language. And sometimes, you know, that, that there is a lot of disagreement in the middle. So, you know, being able to handle different people with different opinions is something that is really, really important. So don't get frustrated if you, you know, you, you spend all the time thinking about something that you think is great and then you, you open a PR and there is someone that says, ah, actually, like, it's not going to work because of this. Um, so, so, you know, just, just come with an open mind. I think that's, that, that's the best thing. And, and it's, it's, we are all here for the, uh, you know, the, the, the health of the language. So, so that sometimes requires patience, uh, most, most, most often than not. Well, and I like what you're saying about the health of the language, too, because, like, there are two kind of motivations for contributing. There's one to, like, improve the project, and then there's, oh, I want my code to be merged, right? And, like, right. getting your code merged is hard, but helping the project isn't necessarily hard. Like, going through issues, especially new ones, and just saying, like, oh, I can reproduce this on this platform, or I can't reproduce it on this platform, um, or uh, helping to review PRs that you feel confident reviewing, or um, just kind of doing the the kind of 
I guess, boring parts. Uh, like I said, that was a lot of how I started out was just doing the triage activities because you learn a lot about the project. You have opportunities when you're one of the first people to you know, respond to an issue and you've gone through the length to reproduce it. You're already reasonably familiar with it and you may be in a better position to actually work on a fix or merge a fix. And the more PRs you review or just the more kind of issues and PRs that you lurk on, uh, you'll also get more familiar with the code as well. And even if you don't feel comfortable like merging code, like if someone's, uh, if there's a discussion on the ideas uh, tracker, or uh, if uh, someone is proposing a change, like weighing in on that as a user is valuable information, especially if something that we're planning is going to break you in some way or another. Um, uh, documentation as well is another really good area. Um, I mean, uh, there's probably good chunks of the code base that don't have good regression testing. So there's lots of areas where like, like there's a lot of opportunities for useful contribution in areas other than just like, oh, I'm getting a PR merged and I'm getting it merged quickly. Right. We have lots of open PRs, like fewer, like if you can help us close PRs, that's a lot more useful than if you can help us open them. Actually, this is going to sound fake, but it's true. We like when, when you become a core developer, you don't want your code to be merged. Like, because if, if your code is merged, the chances that you will be called, like, f because you, you screwed up are much higher. And like, the more code you merge, the more you will be called. Like, and believe me, we are literally go every single day with PyRebel. So, so yeah, yeah. Like, like that, that fades out very quickly once you start, like, you know, actually getting responsible for the things you merge, including other contributors. So, so th there is a lot more ways to, like improve the project without actually like you know having gold be merged. And at the end of the day, you know gold is the enemy. Like the, that, well, like you you want the less amount of code possible. So removing code, good. Like PR removing code, man, those good merge super quickly. Do you want a PR merge in Python? Remove code without breaking people and failing tests. You know, like I've seen so the places good. where my code is running. It's terrifying. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, uh, I, I, I right, sorry. I was just going to say that uh, with that idea of um, a lot of stuff is just open and it's a lot of drudgery, Wukash, I know you're the developer in residence, and that means that you are probably taking on more of the unfun changes and unfun open issues and the sort of housekeeping tasks. Uh, what are some housekeeping tasks that you think are accessible to other people but aren't necessarily pull requests and that sort of things? Oh, okay. So, uh, like, s some of the work I'm doing is, like, co only tangentially related to code. Like, for example, uh, we had, like, issues with running one of our bots on Heroku, and just today I spent time with E, the director of infrastructure on the PSF, to actually move over to some other infrastructure. So, like, that's going to be happening over the next two weeks, um, and, and so on. So, like, that's not going to be, like, super visible in terms of code. But for code, uh, there is definitely like very, very, very kind of a uh, big value in making sure that the bug fix that somebody discovered in Python 3.11, for example, actually reaches 3.11. So since, as I said, we make uh, changes in main, so that's going to be 3.14 now, uh, following how you create a backboard and make sure that all tests pass and so on, like is something that very few external contributors actually do. Uh, and it is important because like, you know, mm, we have bots for this, so if it's as easy as just labeling uh, the backboard, then the backboard just automatically applies. That's good. Like that's what the bots are for. And every now and again, for some silly reason, very often, right? Because they, there's a conflict. When you hear conflict, oh, it's serious. But sometimes it's literally like, oh, uh, you added an import, but somebody else in an unrelated uh, change also added an import. So now there's two imports, and for whatever reason, Git is going to decide, like, you know what, like. This doesn't look good to me. So it's going to conflict and say, which one do you want? And in this case, you want two. Or sometimes it's like you're just adding a, a piece of documentation and somebody reformatted some you know, paragraph before you just to add more information or whatever. So it's going to conflict. So not all conflicts are like very deep, like programming challenges. Sometimes it's like, oh, we're now having a very useful... Uh, support method in testing that allows us to, I don't know, like clean up after yourself. And that didn't exist in the previous version. But you're like, how did we do this before? So you just find how those things were done in tests before and just apply that. And sometimes it's like, oh, there's a, 
um, a little bit that addresses an issue that doesn't exist on an older version because it addresses a feature that doesn't exist. So the backward is actually smaller. So backwards are like un un definitely undervalued because it doesn't appear as your comment even because it's usually created by the tooling and so on. Um, but that's, that's, that's a powerful way to contribute because it makes actually uh, issues like closable, right? Because now it's actually uh, closed uh, across all versions. And then like, there is a lot of contributions that are just essentially just saying like, hey, this is gonna work for me. This is not gonna work for me. That um, a, lot of the, a lot of the times like we have limited experience with some uh, esoteric platforms like running servers on Windows, right? So there's gonna be async IO that runs on Windows but there's less support there, like from the core team, since uh, like usually, as I said, we start with the Unix U1s. Um, so if you happen to be a Windows user and you are into like networking, and this is a very great avenue to kind of look at things to do. Um, if you're not like at all interested in code and you're like, I would still want to help somehow, uh, there is plenty of, uh, you know, kind of ways to contribute in terms of going on our forum and helping others on the Python help section. That is super important because the um, levels of people on this course uh, vary from absolute beginners. You're going to see that probably this is somebody who is not 18 yet that is typing here, but sometimes there are very specific kind of expert issues that, you know, need very concrete help. So helping there is awesome. Uh, working on documentation is very important. There's a, uh, never enough of it and there's always uh you know kind of um, improvements that we can make there there are projects to even translate documentation some of our um languages that we support like they just started with two three people saying hey it would be cool if this were available in french and they just started doing that so they don't even have to come up with their original text if you're like I don't really know how to explain this. You can literally just take this and make available in your language. There might already be a team that does this for your language, but they will definitely say like, yes, we need more help. Uh, so you can contribute like that. You know, there's many other ways, like reproducing issues that you see is, is a wonderful way, especially for like, there are two categories of very tricky ones, right? Like the sort of the newest ones where nobody looked at them yet, but they are relatively kind of quick to actually be looked at somebody. And then you have those like rather oldish ones. So we no longer know, like, are they still kind of really, you know, do they still apply to us? So just bumping those and saying, yeah, that is still happening and so on. Like, is it, it is helpful. It is helpful, um, like kind of input into an issue. So what is not helpful is just pinging an issue, just bump. Right, like, hey, like, when this is gonna be fixed? Like, well, it's not gonna move un until we know more, until somebody puts in the effort. But if you can reproduce, it's like still reproduces. That is a way to bump that will not actually ruffle anybody's feathers. This is a, a, an actual contribution now. So you can essentially do the same thing, but in a productive way. Um, yeah, I don't know okay. if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. The different ways that people can get engaged is. Really interesting right. because you both had, or you three had talked about finding something that motivates you and having more opportunities to find motivation of like, maybe I'm really good at documentation. I'd like it. So that's the avenue I'm going to go. Maybe parser, maybe a compression scheme, like all of the different ways that people can find a bobble that's interesting is really cool to know about because there's a big scope to Python and the different ways people can get involved. Um, we're getting towards the end, so if folks have questions in the audience, feel free to ask. I will try and pay attention to them. I'm very bad at that, so I do apologize. But kind of moving away from contributing and core uh, development, what are some things that Python gives you to play with that are fun? So you had, Lukash had done the uh, synth live demo, uh, and Pablo, you're super into physics. Brent, you are playing with the JIT a lot and are really, really involved in that side of things. So what are the like separate from work stuff that is just fun and nice and not uh, creating pings and distractions? How do you like de-stress in Python and then 
out outside of Hong Kong. We should start, maybe Brandt. Yeah, uh, Pablo started talking, but then his, his I didn't hear anything. Yeah, just to see if you're looking. That's, 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 <laughs> that's why I'm looking at it. Uh, well, I, I used to like do a like the way I would kind of do Python stuff for fun was usually like contributing to Python. Like that's what I did for fun. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I still enjoy it, but ever since I started uh, actually like doing it full time as my job, I was like, oh man, I, I need some new hobbies because I can't also then just go home at the end of the day and then just keep contributing to Python. I mean, I could, but like, I, I, I don't know. Um, and so, like, I tend to kind of gravitate away from Python for most things when I'm just looking to, like, uh, unwind at the end of the day or whatever. But, like, um, I don't know. It's it's always fun to, like, come up with just little projects and th things that are, like, uh, I don't know, work adjacent, I guess. So, like, uh, Pablo sort of mentioned earlier, like, back when we introduced the uh, Specializing Adaptive Interpreter, I just made a little... QT project to kind of show you like what parts of uh, your code had been optimized by it. Um, I've recently just been playing around with like ASTs and writing like pure Python AST optimizers and things like that. Like, I don't know, it's just, it, none of it is like standalone projects. It's more just like, just playing around and saying like, oh, like I bet I could do this uh, sort of things. And that's actually how like the, the JIT started was even though it overlaps with work, it was just like, Oh, like I, I bet I could do this. Like, let's figure out, let's figure out how that would actually work. And the first prototype of the JIT was actually written in pure Python, just because it was fun and interesting, and uh, and Python is powerful enough to JIT itself. What about you, Pablo? Yeah, in my case, I I have a bunch of hobbies outside Python. I play the guitar, which you can see over there. Um, and, um, I, uh, actually keep doing physics from when I was, uh, doing my PhD, I, I still do research, but now I can actually choose what I do <laughs> instead of like having to convince my government to pay me for doing like <laughs> cutting edge things. Um, so now I don't need to like, you know, bump things up. I can just do whatever. And recently I'm doing like these, uh, weird things. For instance, I recently acquired this stupid thing It's a thermal printer. And it's like very cheap things. And uh, I had this stupid idea. So th this is my hobby. I just do stupid things. Like it makes me, it makes me happy. So the last stupid thing I did is that every time someone sends a, a, an issue that tags me, one of these guys get printed. So you see it's like a, it's like a, <laughs> like a receipt of the issue. So you get like the, 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 the image of the contributor and the text and, and whatnot. So it's like a ticket and then like a real ticket and then I need to fix it or something or just, you know, destroy this. Um, it's useless. Um, um, I cannot even recognize the actual image because it's burned. But I had to learn how to implement this stupid protocol. So I did it in Python. Uh, I didn't use any stupid library. I just did it myself. Uh, and and I, I got my stupid library can do all sorts of weird shit. Like actually center this image. Do you see this image of GitHub? It's center. It's not like, it's not the full thing. It's just center. Ah, and I did it because uh, you need to like, you need to tell the, the printer to know how big is the paper because you can have different papers of sizes and there's like a stupid protocol that some stupid person designed because it's very stupid, like it's just hated. Uh, but, but you can do it and it's less painful with Python. Um, and let me tell you something, I, I do Rust a lot. I, I like Rust and I call it in Rust, especially these days instead of C++. Uh, and I started doing it in Rust and it was painful and I hated it. And I, then I switched to Python and I didn't hate it anymore. Uh, awesome, isn't that cool? Uh, that's that's what a cool language is. Uh, I still like Rust, but like you know, maybe maybe it doesn't spark that much joy. Um, buy one of these. It's awesome. This is you know like print your issues from work on this thing, and and you will get double double annoyed by by people issuing people. But it's very cool when you just rip it out and and then you hand it out to someone. Do you also have one of those spikes so when you complete an issue, you can like stab it? Yes, yes, actually yes. Uh, but do you know what happened also? Uh, I have to test a lot. So I have like a mountain of like these half written abominations. Like, I don't know if I have one of these, but like, you know, like when, when, when I started to test them, like they, they didn't look pretty. Uh, let me show you someone. <laughs> look, look, I'm not, I'm not joking. Like look at all this shit. Like the, all of these things are like abominations <laughs> that I have to print. Uh, look, look at this. 
this something went wrong here. Like what what happened there? Who knows? Like I screwed up something and I got some random Unicode. Uh, like then there is this um, when we were there, I have one of the weird ones. <laughs> then that you say like here I was not still be able to like center these these little images for like contributors. Actually, look, this guy is in the chat. Uh, I think so. Well, he was in the chat. It's zero intensity. It's probably some some some. Like, is one of the common people. So he, you're here, you're here, you're in my desk, man, like uh, or woman, like I don't know, like you're, you're, I don't know you, but like you're here in my ticket. Uh, you thought you weren't, but you were here. Um, yeah. So it's very cool. Buy one of these, and you, your desk will be full of these like ticket thingies. That's delightful. Okay, your turn. Well, uh, it's it's no secret. Like um, you mentioned my Euro Python talk, it was about like, hey, I also like music and. Actually, kind of the most interesting things happen like when things connect. So, uh, like every now and again, you would need something to sequence something else or something to synthesize something else. And I would use Python for a lot of things. I have this keyboard synthesizer that I really like and really hate at the same time. It's called the Waldorf Iridium. It is the probably the most powerful synthesis engine that is in a hardware synthesizer, but it has like some really like like badly thought through uh, like performance uh, issues, like when you actually try to perform on things because I'm classically trained, so I have some expectations how the sustain pedal is going to work and, you know, what's going to happen when you run out of voices and you still play more notes, like, and so on and so on. So, and, you know, like before I was a disgruntled uh, consumer here, I couldn't, you know, really do anything because that firmware is closed. I cannot really contribute to that. But then I figured out that like actually all of this is MIDI, so I can just filter the, the the signals and implement my sustain pedal myself, and you know fix a bunch of other issues with like voice stealing, whatever, just myself. So this sort of like very simple scripts that like later on you just use for to make your life a little less frustrating, like that is uh, something I do a lot. Like you know when Apple changed their uh, kind of format of. Uh, photo libraries, like I used Aperture, like back in the day, there was an app called Aperture. And then they uh, switched to Photos app, which is what everybody now has on their Macs. Um, in theory, the Aperture library should load, but in practice, mine didn't, it always crashed photos. So I wrote a Python script that would actually recreate the current uh, library structure from what I had there before, which was gigabytes and gigabytes of photos. And that saved me from like actually having to manually go through JPEGs that were just not well named and like CR2s, which were Canon or RAW files, which you couldn't even at the time preview in Finder. So it would be a terrible experience, but like with a bunch of Python, it all converted by itself. And with a few exceptions that, you know, it turned out that like Aperture uh, slow in time was corrupting your own database, but like only a few photos were affected. So most people probably didn't ever notice, but you know, it wasn't perfect. So yeah, I was able to like move all this and so on and so on. So I, I write a ton of little programs like these, uh, things that like help me organize my notes. So I have a lot of notes for different sort of things that I do in life and for work as well, just a lot. Like I have very uh, short memory. Uh, so I do support myself with a bunch of notes. If I lost my uh, shell history, that would probably slow me down for a week. Uh, since a, a lot is just in the recent uh, history of stuff that I'm doing, it's just like, yeah, like type something in, up arrow, type something in, up arrow. Like I'm very used to that sort of workflow. So yeah, a bunch of scripts like these. I even run the weird shell that is called Z-O-N-S-H, but it's pronounced conch. And it's conch. a shell where you can, yeah, <laughs> yes, where you can actually uh, run Python code and it's written in Python. It starts up a little slow, so if you're used to just opening a terminal window and just typing like to it like right away, you're gonna be frustrated. But the ability to actually just like run a for loop and have a string from environment and be able to call Python methods on that string, like for me that's amazing. And my uh, kind of environment file, like the kind of I don't know the profile file for uh, for conch, just looks like a Python module, which is the cleanest my environment has ever looked like. So. I like this. So yeah, I would advise anybody to just do weird things with Python. And now it's a good time to do this. Somebody very early on in the stream asked a very good question about Python 3.13, so it's related. Uh, what is, what is uh, like mobile support? Well, what does it mean that we are supporting mobile platforms? 
So currently, it doesn't mean that there's going to be a Python application on the Apple App Store or on Google Play. But what it means is Python now is embeddable, meaning you can add it to your Swift application or your Kotlin application and release a, a mobile application with Python inside it. And what that means is you can write an app that is going to be scriptable by the user. So you, you won't have to release like, uh, you know, a newer version for them to be able to do something. They can write it themselves. So it's, again, a feature that is not, um, at least now, directed at end users, but it's directed as uh, mobile application developers today to make sure that like they can use Python in a better way. And Beware, an Anaconda project right now, is working on being able to build end-to-end uh, -end mobile applications in Python. Um, I'm not sure like how far along that is, but I know for sure that today the embedding story where you can uh, have Python inside your application and actually have it accepted by Apple in the Apple App Store, that is something that is going to be supported from now on by the Python project uh, ourselves. So yeah, a very good time to do weird things in Python that were not necessarily possible before. Neat. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. Um, and I'm very bad at this stage of these type of events. So soldiering on, is there any tooling in the Python ecosystem that you've been keeping your eye on, whether it's packaging, general CLI tools, etc. by Bob Bob? Like, like I as like following the tracker or like like I as like waiting for for the thing to finish or like what what does it mean? Uh, either. Bob Bob says either. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I've been like following with a lot of like uh, joy all the astral stuff like you know Raf uh, UV uh, secret new projects that may or may not I check your code. Um, so, so that is awesome. Like these guys are awesome. Um, all of them are cool and their projects rock. So like, you know, it's cool. And sometimes I just open their thing and just read the code. It's a lot of rust, which I like. Uh, someone was really like shocked by that, but, but I do. It's a cool language. It's just very ugly. Um, but yeah, I just like to read it. And I do this all the time. Like, it's just like say, how is this implemented? And sometimes it's disgusting. Like, do you know, like Lipsy, have you opened Lipsy at some point? It's disgusting. Everything that you want is under six levels of macros. Why? Who knows? Sometimes it's so stupid that they define void as void. Like it's just define void, void. Who knows? It's just the, 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 <laughs> the, the, the gods. Like who, who knows what's going on? But like astral stuff is always very clean. I, I, I really enjoy, like there is this file in UV which re-implements uh, sysconfig. Well, not sysconfig, sorry. Like uh, some, some parts of sysconfig and some parts of... Um, um, what is the thing that we rip out from CPython? Um, this details, this details, yes, yes, some parts of these details. Um, man, it's so clean, and the Python file was suboptimal, so so you know, like, uh, it's awesome. And you will learn, learn like a lot of different, like, especially in a new language, like that, that is not your main one. Like, reading all these people's code is, is, is super, super, super good because, like, you, you, you get all these like cool tricks in Python now, it's a bit less common that I learn like cool tricks that I just say. I'm going to start doing this all the time. But in Rust, it still happens quite well a lot. So, so I, I enjoy reading. So yeah, I, I would say um, all the astral tools. What about the two of you? I'd say Astral is a good source of exciting new stuff you happening. Copy me, man. Like, you can just copy me. Like, you know, I say it first. Well, like, I, that's the first place. I'd like, I, I don't know about like new stuff. Like when people ask me like, oh, what's your favorite like Python package, right? Like my answer is always Hypothesis just because it's so damn cool. Um, like if you haven't heard of Hypothesis, you should try it out. It's um, It will change the way you write tests. At least it did for me. And um uh essentially it basically just fuzzes your tests and it minimizes uh, failing examples and um it's a really kind of clean way of uh sort of increasing the peace of mind when you're writing tests and also getting you to think about uh kind of what the purpose of testing is and um and uh doing things differently so i think that that's cool because it's like 
it's very unique and it does one thing and it does it really, really well, but it's not new or exciting or anything, but I think Astral is also a good source of new and exciting things right now. But what about Membrane, man? Like, you didn't even mention Membrane. My heart is broken. I figured if someone was going to mention Memory, it wasn't going to be me. Oh, but no, I cannot just say that I follow my own package. Like, do you know, like that, that would be stupid. Like, I, I'm not, I'm not that, uh, I'm not that obnoxious. I'm more of a pie stack <laughs> Maybe we person. could say. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, li listen to this person. He knows. He's a connoisseur. <laughs> uh, very good, very good. What about Lukash. you, Lukash? Well, um, I will not mention any project by Charlie Marsh then, since I'm third, so it would be just like, uh, really? No, I'm going to uh, mention PyScript, which was already there in the uh, in, in the chat, but I guess like I, sh I, I, I have like, I don't know, the creds for it because I, uh, I attend some of their meetings. I uh, did like I maybe influence a little some of what they're doing right now, but mostly I'm a very happy user of this. It is uh, one of those things where when I started with Python, I was like, yeah, it would be cool if I could do this like front end. So there's nothing to install. You can just point people at a link and then they can just play with something that I made in Python. Uh, and PyScript is essentially that. It is uh, still like an early stages project. Like, so you're gonna see rough edges. But it basically works. Uh, I already had a, a talk at the big PyCon US and at PyCon Poland about how you can do WebGL with Python right now, like to the point where if you really wanted, you could like skip JavaScript altogether and just write Web, WebGL uh, like with only Python in the browser. But obviously you don't want to do that because there is a ton of higher level things that you would need to implement yourself. So there's a fantastic uh, JavaScript library called 3JS. And with PyScript, you can just call those uh, like ready-made functions for you, create those objects and interact with them. And what you get are just 3D worlds that you can now build with Python that other people can just run, including on their phones, which I think is pretty cool because it's a, it's a relatively new technology in terms of adoption. Like it's been there for a long while, but now it's just, very kind of aesthetically pleasing because you can see the result, you know, kind of things are actually moving. You can influ influence them with touch on the phone or with a mouse or something. And like, it's, uh, it's great that they're working on this and it's uh, becoming only better in time. So I'm very excited about like, you know, what, what is going to bring us to the future. But even today it is already awesome. Like, you know, kind of, yeah, obviously, I'm not going to say don't watch my talk. So, yeah, watch my talk and see what you think, you know, because I, I, I really, I really like where it's going. We are coming close to the end of time. So uh, we briefly hit on it. Uh, you think? A couple we, of we, we don't really have much left? Oh, no. Like, I, I, I still want it to be like at least 40 when I die. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I have some opinions on the end of time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I have a, a question for you, Pablo. Yeah. Are we going to get a better end body simulation in the Python test? <laughs> Are you going welcome. to implement uh, Barnes Hut uh, or Octals? Optimization. N not the not the oak tree, but the quad tree maybe. Like because it'll be so light in the oak tree is always like Benoit. Okay, I will I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. When? <laughs> I will do it. Actually, but honestly, man, I, I do honestly, have yeah. I, I do like, have this something. is a great contribution for somebody. You can review it, let somebody else do it. Like there's thirty nine people left like at one AM our time. So we Exactly, we exactly. Meet. Everyone maybe Gold somebody with... here will be like, Yeah, and yes. Like maybe, yeah, maybe I have the sound effect. For this. Do you want to contribute to C Python? Add this benchmark to the benchmark sheet. Go and read Barnes had M body simulation. Use the 2D version, not the 3D version, because I'm like reviewing that is very annoying. The 2D version. Build a 2P3, like add a six ton of like particles and shit, and contribute that to Python uh, slash uh, pipe. Performance, um, and 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 you will become the hero of pi performance. 
Very important. Or you could just write and contribute any other benchmark that you want us to make faster. No. If you have just a pure Python benchmark. or just almost pure Python, Python workload, and you want, and you want us thing. to make it faster, it doesn't have to be physics problem. He's going to give you a benchmark. He doesn't care about your benchmark. He cares about getting it. Yeah. I want to get your benchmarks. Just there is there is some uh, also there is some um, like uh, I think internal joke here, so I will explain it. The reason I wanted to contribute this is so Brian can do it. Like it's, it's just I, I I'm not like doing other things. So the, the, I originally complained that the embody simulation that we have, which I think was the first one that you got faster, right? Yeah, um, that was the first one that I was able to run without crashing. Yeah. Right, right, so which is pretty cool, but the, the embody simulation that we had, I was really disappointed that it was a really a crappy simulation with like seven bodies, like you know, you could, you, like having n body there is almost like a like a stretch, you know, maybe like you know, like seven body simulation, like you can actually write the seven, uh, but the, like you know, like we need a big one, so so you know, and and, and by the way, if you forget about contributing, this algorithm is awesome. It's just the very simple space partitioning tree. Uh, like you also learn like not only the tree part like which which you will say I know how to do this it's just splitting the thing in the middle mm, just read out read about it it's maybe not that simple because you need to like ah it's, it's not this simple you need to put bodies on the thing it's not simple uh, and then you also learn some physics because like you need to calculate like you know all these like substantive angles just to know like like the, the center of mass shit like it's very cool really cool and then you can just you can just put like one million one million bodies. Uh, and you can simulate an entire galaxy. Wow. You need to get like the, you know, velocities and whatever, right? So it looks like a galaxy and it doesn't just explode. But you can ask ChatGPT for the actual velocities and it will give you that, some of the pre-made ones. And, and you can put it and you can use MapleLib or Pygame and you have something really impressive. And if you want to make Google Schlange, uh happy, you can put that thing on PyScript and show it to your friends in the browser. Wow. Amazing. And then Brown can do it. You will make the three of us happy. You will see, it's amazing. If you implement this thing, you will make three core developers happy. Like, like for different reasons. Isn't this cool? Just go and implement it. Today. I think that that is... Yeah, you have eight. 23 hours left. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the time is counted. Just, you know, go and learn all these things. <laughs> Man, I, I, it's out of the joke. So, so one of the first thing I did ever in Python, ever, like when I was in my PhD, it was implementing this algorithm, and it sucked. Like I did it so badly because I knew shit. Like I didn't knew Python. Like it was amazingly bad and disgusting, and it was slower than the, than the quadratic version. That's how bad it was. Like it's just <laughs> this is not supposed to happen. Like ever, and it was slower than the quadratic version. You need to be really bad at it, and I was. Uh, and I think I have that code there. So maybe I can contribute that stupid benchmark because like, if that gets faster, <laughs> like, I, I will, I will, like, I, I just need to wait for like 12 years until someone who actually knows how to make my code faster appears in the picture. You can't just rely on JITs to fix all your quadratic time algorithms, whether it's Frankenstein no, or physics. Just one, or... just one, just, just the Frankenstein one. Well, t technically it was not my algorithm. We inherited this from, from, mm. from the other people that did the stuff. You know, you can just... <laughs> Okay. Um, I think uh, ending with a call to action to contribute a specific thing that'll make everyone happy is a really great point to start wrapping it up. So, uh, Python 3.13 has been released. Uh, Tomas was the release manager. Uh, and we have a whole bunch of new features in it, including the ability to compile it uh, ourselves to take advantage of the JIT and the free threading options. And there's a lot of other really cool things that it lets you do to kind of make Python fun and to play with in the world. What uh, do you want people to think about and poke at and do weird things with? Try to break the repl. No. Pablo will no. thank you. No, don't listen to this guy. He just wants to trick you. No, 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 no. Don't do uh, anything other than just like very slowly type your code. Or, like maybe press F1 from time to time, but not twice. Some weird shit happen if you do it twice. 
Don't break his Write, write a program that pays Frankenstein, but every time they say Frankenstein, it pays Frankenstein. Again, yes. <laughs> you can implement the right. Frankenstein command because then now, as if you watch uh, Wukesh's keynote, you will see a new Python. Uh, the video is online. You can you can go and watch it. You will, you will see that implement the new commands on your own repo uh, by some hacks. It's very simple, so you can you can implement this Frankenstein command. Yes, like this is what I was about to say because like usually it's like me saying like yeah, the new repo is awesome, but it's so much work like still ahead of us. Like so that is like actually kind of rock solid. And Pablo is like, no, don't be so negative. It's amazing. Like when you come back to Python three twelve now, it just feels like it's from a different era. It's like already like super outdated compared to three thirteen. Uh, and I agree with him, but like also what we are really excited by like with the REPL in particular is that it is in Python. Like it is a py Python code written in Python. This is not very popular these days. Everybody rewrites Python tooling in Rust. So here you actually have a movement towards Python for some functionality. So it is easier to contribute to that than to anything else. And you don't have to start with like saying like, oh, I'm going to be a contributor. Just like do strange things to it, add a command, add a keyboard shortcut to your own REPL and see what's going to happen. Like, you know, I have examples in the EuroPython talk of just doing that. And you, you can you can do a bunch of those things. Should you rely on this and release it on PyPI? No, this is an underscored package. Like those APIs are going to change like all the time until uh, we actually make it a um, public API. But even if it breaks your like toy code, like you can adapt your toy code and just keep doing this. But, you know, you're tricking yourself into learning a piece of CPython, and now you can contribute to it if you want to. You don't have to, but if you choose to contribute, this is a really nice avenue for you to do this and to just have a repo that is a little more personalized for you than it was before, than it could be before. So, yeah, that's one thing. And, like, in general, just do weird stuff with Python. Just try to run it on mobile. I did, and it worked. Like, try to run it in browser. I did, and it worked. Like do music with Python, I did, and it worked. So you know, just do like, be a user. Like the 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 better user you are, the you know the the more kind of powerful you're gonna be as a contributor because you're gonna recognize where the actual problems are and where the really awesome use cases are. A lot of people ask me like, hey, what's with the free threaded Python? Like, what is it gonna solve? And you know, we, we know a bunch of things that might be better today, but I really hope that this is going to enable an entire new class of uses for Python that nobody thought about before because it was like, no, Python is not good at this. So now, may, now maybe it will. So go and do weird stuff with Python. Yeah, try out the free threaded build. If you maintain a package, like try testing CI with the free threaded build to try to break the standard library with the free threaded build. Like the, this is like the chance to like try it out and see what works for you and how it improves your code or whatever. And you can bug you can bug library authors to to test it out too. Right. Okay. Um, do you guys have anything you'd like to plug at the very end? I know two of you are the hosts of the Core.py Python podcast, where you can find more conversations of this variety. Anything else? Band? No. More Go and listen to core.py. Core.py. Just do it. It's <laughs> awesome. It's, it's great. Awesome. Brand appears two times. And it's still, I, I mean, I told you, and I thought like you'd intentionally omit it the next episode, but you've mentioned me by name in every episode. So you should stop doing that. In every episode? <laughs> every really? single episode. Yeah. Wow. Is this true? I think so. Well, someone will Amazing. have to go and listen That's to why it's such a good mind. episode. Man, we cannot break this. That's why it's such now. a good show, yeah. Uh, there, is, there is nothing I hate more. I challenge you to not mention me by name in the next episode. No, no, no. We need to. I want to start the episode no, by no, saying, no, no, Bram no, Booker, no, no, and then we will no, start. No, Challenge accepted. We will talk about brand without mentioning You're just, sens you're just going to censor me. Right. Like, we, we, we have the technology. Look, Bram Booker. <laughs> He's a... <laughs> and he did the before. <laughs> yeah, you hear it here. But you didn't hear it here. <laughs> well, thank you three for joining us. Uh, this was incredibly short notice. Uh, thank you for being open to it. I had a whole bunch of questions, and I'm really glad that you answered them and were willing to talk to me and talk with the Python Discord community.
about kind That's of fun. Python and keep building it and not just using it, but kind of looking inside. Awesome. See you uh, in in that uh, PR improvement Martin has had in, in, in Py Performance. And thanks for pulling me up on stage. Yeah, thank you for being up for joining all. Uh, all right, yeah, that was before, awesome. Yeah, before I go, I want to uh, first thank Pablo, Gugash, and Brent uh, for joining. This was incredibly short notice. Um, I threw this together, and uh, the staff on our Discord did an amazing job helping me put this together. You've seen them join uh, in the chat and help put stuff together. Janine is on vacation, or Kat is on vacation today, so she couldn't join, but she just helped a lot and was like, okay, you need this, you need this, you need this. And as you might have been able to tell, I kind of wing stuff, so I needed all of that advice. And uh, also want to call out that the current release manager, Tomas, uh, has done an amazing job and made a really good but like tough decision a week ago to push the release a little bit further back. That way, this version of Python with as much as it has going on in it could be released with a little bit more confidence that it's going to be a little bit better. That is a fantastic thing, and the Python community is really, really cool. And everyone, I really appreciate you. So on that note, I'm going to hop off and end this stage. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, yeah. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Yeah, awesome. Bye. Bye.